Welcome back to the um, lecture series. Um, so after um, the talk on Tuesday, we're now going to today hear about um, ways of um, analyzing the images that one can obtain using conventional microscopy and um, also with applications, I guess, to other, other areas of research. Okay. Sounds like people can hear us. So um, I'll hand over to Jerome. So good morning, everybody. So I will talk about image processing uh, for light microscopy. It's a, a new talk compared to the previous years where last, last year I was focusing more on tools. Here I am a bit more general. And I still try to um, be practical and give ideas of how to process images um, using software for you. Um, so, but first of all, why do we uh, process images? Uh, first, we want to improve the image quality. We want to improve the signal to noise ratio, the sharpness, uh, reduce the noise, uh, correct the background, uh, find uh, reference frames, stabilize the image, register images, we want to recognize object and feature this um, segment our image uh, into uh, by attributing uh, each pixel to a semantic class. So is it foreground or background? Or identify instances of object. We want to detect how many spots there are, how many uh, mitochondria, how many, how many nuclei. Um, we also want to quantify biological processes. So already by counting, you start to have an idea of uh, of the number you can put on your data. You can also measure intensity, shapes, have some shape descriptor, the area, the perimeter volume, some curvature, roughness. You can also measure motion, like the velocity of uh, the objects or their deformation. So this is, so here I have a small uh, idea of how we improve our image, and basically here we our segmentation, we want to attribute some uh, identity into on our objects. Um, so in general, we will def define a workflow to do this. In light microscopy and in biology in general, we, we have here um, uh, to define often um, specific workflow for each problem we have for each uh, experiment. So it's often hard to just reuse or to define a very standardized pipeline. So we need a lot of scripting. We have to be able to um, put these tools together. So this makes a very diff big difference compared to um, medical imaging or even cryo EM where there is a pipeline and this pipeline will bring you from the raw data to um, the model or, or the information you, you are looking for. Uh, one, so I put this slide here because one first thing which is quite important in, in, uh, in light microscopy is uh, that we want to, to have a look at the data. So we, we so these are not just a pretty picture, you still, just want to have a look at them, try to build an overview of the project, um, estimate the viability, have an, an idea if what you want to quantify is at all uh, possible. If you see it, you, you have to discard outliers on well uh, grounded uh, principles or like the image is overexposed or the cell is dead. You can't blindly batch process thousands of images and just think at the end of the project what happened. This, this is often at the mid-scale kind of uh, level of image analysis we, we are of pipeline, it's not high throughput, then we often need to go through the image and get an idea of what we are looking at. This is, so the best thing to do is to build a gallery of your image, have a quick look, make a dimensional reduction, maximum intensity, uh, or and have a look at the, at the 
but the the picture don't go directly to the box plot and then have to go back to the to the data because it, it will waste time so first what is an image so let's say it's just a measurement on the regularly sample grid so here on the top picture we have uh, some number which are uh, the intensity value at each pixel so the an image can be represented like this as an array of pixels, like you would open an Excel uh, spreadsheet and you will have numbers. It would be a first way of looking at it. It could be seen as a more mathematical version of a continuous function. So here down, we have the same image, but represented like a smooth surface, which maps X and Y to, uh, to an elevation, which would be the intensity. We could think that this uh, discretized uh, uh, matrix of pixel is actually uh, a sample version of a continuous function. Can represent our image without loss by taking its Fourier transform. So represent it as a combination of various uh, frequency on phase shift. We could consider that each uh, pixel is a random re realization of a uh, random field, random marker field, with a dependency between the pixels and with an unknown variable, which will be underlying the process we see. Um, we can have consider uh, it as a sum of coefficient of a wavelet transform or any other transform, a, a more redundant transform, so just a dictionary of features. So there are many ways, and this way of representing the image allows you to develop uh, processing tools in general. Image filtering. So the first thing you, you think about image processing is image filtering. So here I'll just introduce some, some basic ideas that what is a linear filter or convolution? So the two things are the same. Is to uh, combine nearby pixels. So for each pixel here in the center of the orange uh, square, we will combine all the pixels with some weights. So if the weights are all the same, it will be an average, and replace the center pixel by the value of the average, so in a new image. This uh, operation corresponds to a multiplication in Fourier space by uh, of the Fourier transform of the image by the Fourier transform of the mask. So the small mask here can be seen as a small image. So we have different uh, examples, such as the mean filter, the average filter, the Gaussian filter, can have some sharpening. All these are, can be written as a sum of the pixel in the neighborhood weighted by some weights, which doesn't depend, uh, which don't depend on, on the data themselves. So this uh, is the principle of linear filter. When the weight depends on the intensity of the pixel R, then we can start to talk about nonlinear filters. So we would have some, some weight which depend on the, the image itself or some other uh, images. Um, there could be a median filter. You rank all the pixels and you take the, the, the median uh, values, the one in the middle. You can have mean max filter. So these are uh, some, some rank filter in general. We can have uh, so weights which are de de depending on the intensity or on the distance to the center, for example, like a bilateral filter or the surface filter, I think it's called in other place. The idea is for the linear filter is you have the idea that you would paint a small um, uh, a small line, all the object would be a small line using a, a thicker brush, and the brush correspond to um, to the to the kernel, which we call the orange uh, square is called a kernel, uh, and replace each pixel by by the kernel. So this is the image filtering. Now we can also um, consider that we want to solve our image processing uh, problem considering a more uh, probabilistic, a Bayesian and a variational approaches. So, so the idea is to consider, uh, to look for um, the, 
having a model of what you see, so the likelihood, uh, and an a priori on what you expect, and combine them into uh, a cost function that you will minimize. So, if, so by doing, for example, a gradient descent, like we just saw now, with a little ball going down. So this cost function is built by the graph on the top. So we, if we have an estimate, or an initial estimate, which would be the, the point at the beginning, we use our model, which for example, would be uh, our microscopy observation model okay, that we will see in a moment. We will simulate an image and compute the likelihood of seeing this image knowing the data. Now on our estimate, we also have an a priori on the smoothness of, of, of this uh, estimate, such some idea of regularity. And then we combine it to cost into a single one. We will compute the gradient, for example, to update our estimate. Um, if we loop this, we basically do our gradient descent. So many filters, uh, even the, the Gaussian filter, the average, averaging filter could be interpreted in this context. So it's, it's also a different view. It's not only an algorithm, it's also a view on the problem. You, you have also learning-based approach. So where you would have uh, some input, some known input on known lab associated to a known label. So you have a pair of X and Y. The input could be some images on the label for be, for example, here we have an image of a cat, the output will be a label that it is a cat that internally will be represented as a number. And we define a model which links a X and a Y with a free parameter to estimate. So in a simpler case, the model could be a linear regression. So you would have uh, the slope and the offset of this linear regression to estimate. And then you define a cost function to compare, to compare the predicted output of f of x on the y that you know. You optimize this cost function. So in the case of a, of a slope, you could do a, a least square. And then given next time, given an in, unseen input, you will want to predict the, the corresponding label, the y. So this is machine learning approach in, in general. Then in the case of uh, more recent deep learning approaches, the difference is that we don't know, we don't set in advance the um, a transformation of the data. So we leave the data as they are, and we, we don't pre-compute some uh, feature. We leave the algorithm find a feature for us. Now, the images that the microscope uh, are taking are photon limited. So the number of, of collected photons are a function of the exposure time and the illumination. Um, the photon interact with the sample, so they create free radicals, there is photo bleaching of the fluorophore, etc. So the, the key message is that the number of photons that can be used to image a sample is limited. So this is a very important thing that you all know. Um, and then this leads to um, an image which is noisy. First thing is, so here I have, I have bucket. So we are basically doing some photo counting. So it's like counting the drop in a bucket where the bucket is our pixel on the CCD or the, the uh, photo multiplier tube. Um, so by counting photon, we have a Poisson distribu distribution of the number of detected events. Here, we have a specific characteristic of the photon counting process is that the amplitude of the noise is equal to the expected number of photons. We have also two other kinds of noise. We have a dark current. So even in, in a, without any photon reaching the sensor, the sensor will auto-generate some photoelectron. In general, the dark current is very low. So it's very few electrons per second. But if the exposure time becomes very long, this starts to be uh, important. Now there is more uh, important noise in, uh, in cameras in general, the readout noise. 
So there are thermal fluctuations in electronic circuitry that lead to variation of the currents, so, so which are expressed in electron by uh, in the root mid square or so electron RMS is an, or median is uh, what you will see on the doc documentation. So here, for example, is is a uh, if you, if you want to buy a camera or use a camera, you can have these numbers at hand. So you, you will see 82 uh, QE per person QE, so the number of photoelectrons generated for each uh, electron. Uh, and then you have this readout noise depending on the frame rate of the camera. So this is important. It links the number of photon, of photon electron to the gray value you have on the, on the image on when you open the image. Um, and this allow, enable you to predict the noise distribution. So this will help you to build a likelihood function, for example, in a, in a, in a variational approach or a Bayesian approach. And also it helps you to compare sensors. So you can, uh, when you want to do uh, some imaging, you will want to know if you given the number of photos you think you will have, uh, be best at using this camera or that camera or using a confocal microscope. So now we would like to get rid of this artifact using image processing. So it's called image denoising. And the idea is to estimate an image which would be the same uh, than if we would have taken many images of the same scene in a virtual experiment. The idea is to remove stochastic noise while preserving fine features and intensity of the image. So this is a difficult part. It's easy to remove variation uh, in the image by taking, taking average, for example, but it will be difficult to preserve the features of the image doing so. So here's a, a work I did during my PhD uh, which is using patches in the image to denoise um, uh, and reconstruct uh, a noise-free image while preserving uh, discontinuities. It uses an uh, accurate Poisson-Gaussian noise uh, model using variance stabilization to convert Poisson-Gaussian noise into a, a, a Gaussian noise and whose parameters are estimated uh, online. Online means uh, on the on the image, directly on the image, and it can be seen also interpreted as a variational uh, approach, which enforce. So the a priori is here is to enforce the distance, the re redundancy between image blocks. It tries to find blocks which are similar and keep this similarity uh, uh, um, increase this similarity. It exploits also, so this is a very rare feature in the, in the filtering uh, approaches you can find. It's, it will exploit the 3D information on the temporal redundancy, so it's 3D plus time. We have here um, in, in the center a little uh, experiment where we denoise several uh, images taken with different exposure time. And uh, we could see that we, uh, with denoising so in green, we get a gain in a signal to noise ratio, which will correspond to roughly 17 times gain in, uh, in exposure time. And here, finally, we see an example. On top is a raw image, and the bottom is a denoised version of the image. Uh, re more recently, there will be um, uh, some deep learning uh, approaches for image denoising. Uh, in particular, in the case where you can collect a pair of noisy or noise-free images by taking an image of the same uh, sample with um, without uh, uh, with low exposure and one with high, um, high exposure, and then you will try train a, a network to map the noise image to the clean image. So we learn a mapping between the two images. And then you will get some very interesting results like this one, but 
um, which are very tailored to the kind of images you uh, have acquired. So it's possible then to go beyond what a normal method, no, not, not aware of the content of the image, uh, would, uh, would do basically. So it will improve beyond, beyond this because it knows basically what you are looking for, what it should look like because you trained it on this specific example. Um, so yeah, so this requires a bit more work, but probably worth it when when you are really when you really need it. And then it's accessible in Fiji, so you can you can also use it in a more uh, friendly and uh, in a friendly environment. While the the training in general is done in in um, in Python originally, but now tools are evolving and start to be more and more accessible in in Fiji. So the other aspect of the image uh, that uh, microscopes are producing is that they are band limited. Um, so we can approximate the image formation, the physical image formation process by a 3D linear filtering, so a convolution, by a point spread function. So this, I, I repeat, it's the multiplication in Fourier space by an optical transfer function. And this optical transfer function vanishes beyond uh, x, y resolution limit, which is given by the wavelength divided by twice the numerical aperture. So this is the AB resolution limit. So we see here, so we go from the image space, this cat, to the uh, Fourier space. And we see that beyond this ring in 2D here, we have zero, nothing. So we don't obsess Basically, you don't observe any information, any useful information. What you will see in a normal image, here is a bit um, uncraft, but um, in the normal image, you would have here some noise. Here it has been removed, just for uh, clarity. Um, but this has no uh, information acquired by the microscope. Um, and the other thing is uh, the Nikwi Shannon theorem about sampling is uh, that if we have a, uh, a signal which is like here, band limited, and, and um, regularly sampled on the on the grid, then we uh, we can sample it at twice uh, the resolution limit, and doing so, we will lose no information. So this is an inf important thing. So if you, uh, so if you, if you sample at twice the resolution limit, you don't lose information. Now in some time, in some, in some context, the information will be lost because of, of the noise. And you have to make a compromise between the size of the pixel, which is integrating photons and, um, so the, on giving you a noise level on the uh, ideal sampling uh, frequency. So there is still a bit of wiggle room around here, but ideally you would try to sample your image at twice uh, the resolution limit. So the point spread function is the sort of uh, paintbrush we use to draw our image, that the microscope is using to draw the image. When we do this, uh, when we consider a point spread function, we assume that the microscope response is linear and the same at each point of the image. It's a, again, it's an image of a point view by the microscope. So each point of your sample, each molecule, let's say they are small enough to be considered as point will be replaced by a big blob. So here we have two green function corresponding to different um, uh, aperture on the confocal microscope. So the, not aperture, but the aperture of the pinhole. So we have one area unit and five area unit. Five area unit, you are almost in a, in a wide field mode. The point spread function is a, is a, so is an, is a function of the numerical aperture. So the, the wavelength, because it's linked to the uh, 
to the resolution we can have, so the, uh, the AB uh, criterion. It's linked also to the aberration, so you will see the deformation of the PSF when things are like uh, mismatch of uh, index happen. So bringing spherical aberration, for example. And then we can compensate and invert this process by doing image deconvolution. The idea is to try to uh, increase the sharpness on the signal to noise ratio across the frequency. And ideally, a simple Fourier uh, uh, division in Fourier space. So we saw that the convolution was a division, a uh, multiplication. So a deconvolution could be a division by the uh, Fourier transform of the point spread function. Problem we saw it, it goes to zero. So for a simple reason, a basic reason of not dividing by zero, if you want, the simplest view on, on it is, is this, you don't want to divide by zero. The main uh, thing is that the images are noisy in general. So the noise is amplified and the noise depends on the intensity. So we, we don't have uh, control of this. So what you, you do in general is to use a model, a noise model on an a priori to prevent the noise amplification. And you will, again, like in the Bayesian and Bayesian approach slide I presented, use an optimization procedure to re retrieve your image. So the common algorithm are the Wiener filter, which is um, as an explicit uh, form or more uh, specific to microscopy or, uh, in, or um, astronomy also is very much used, the Richardson-Lucy algorithm. There is some other algorithm called the conjugate gradient, which is just an optimization procedure, which uh, lets you uh, mix in your various noise model or a priori you want to use. So here is an example of deconvolution using data from Lake. Huh? So even on the confocal, you could also deconvolve your image, not uh, restricted to uh, wet field imaging. So the software themselves, you can use Eugens, which um, uh, from SVI, so it's commercial software. We have two licenses in, in uh, the analysis room. Uh, the, the, the nice part of this software is try to guide you through the steps uh, where you need to pass the metadata to know the uh, PSF parameter. And it contains two, uh, a few algorithms which are uh, well matched to microscopy. And it also run on the GPU. So now it's very, uh, it's very fast and allows you, for example, to, to batch process uh, a few uh, images on the GPU, it's, it's really going faster than on the CPU on this, uh, on this. So we have two, one has a long uh, uh, license for bigger GPU and one has a license for smaller GPU. Uh, then there is also Deconvolution Lab 2 in uh, Fiji, which uh, combined with the PSF generator. It's, it has a lot of recent algorithm. I, I find it difficult to use. Uh, also, you need to take care of um, all the detail on your image uh, generation. So all the metadata, you have to understand what you are doing a bit more. You have also to set yourself a background while in audience will help you to estimate a background. Uh, there is now uh, the ops in Fiji, which is uh, operator which allows you to access some Richardson Lucy or Richardson Lucy with uh, some regularization called TV. So total, for total variation. In MATLAB, if you, if you have access to MATLAB, we, so there is uh, a few license, uh, one uh, license in uh, 1N 120, so you will have access in the imaging toolbox, image processing toolbox, uh, the convolution uh, of Richardson Lucy on the Wiener filter. In Python, you will have a few uh, routine for the uh, convolution in scikit image, for example. Um, now you, so I was talking in the first slide where you want to uh, process your image, you want to register image between um, 
different time point for or different channel. You want to stitch uh, your image uh, to in a big tile and adjust the small shift between the tiles. You want to build um, an atlas of the organ, like a brain. So this is called image registration. The input data can be some landmark, some or the intensity. So the landmarks are control points, and well, you, on the, you can also have a mix input combining landmark and intensity. You can have different deformation models. You have a parametric model, like translation, tr rotation, rigid body, uh, affine. You can have um, a non-parametric model and try to estimate a dense uh, deformation field. So we have a few kind of uh, approaches. You have um, so correlation-based approach, where you can try to find a global uh, deformation, which will be in general just a, a translation. So this will be used for drift correction on channel alignment. So you can have the normalized cross correlation. You could do it in image or in frequency space. You could compute uh, phase, use phase correlation in, in a Fourier space, or if you want to deal with um, uh, rotation, you can have a sort of polar Fourier transform, which is called Fourier Malin transform. You can also try to estimate a dense displacement field using normalized cross correlation. So you basically do a block matching. So you find the, the block in a neighborhood uh, of each pixel, which looks the most similar. And this gives you, uh, in, the next, in the next image, so this gives you um, a displacement. So this approach in general is very noisy. It's also called in general a PIV, or particle image uh, velocimetry, but okay. It's a bit uh, fuzzy, the nomenclature around this. Um, so this is the base, uh, the basic techniques, the correlation based approach. Now there is also some landmark based uh, registration where you try to find some uh, points. So either you define them manually or you use some feature detector to find a point of interest. And then you match this point between the two images, either using uh, descriptors or using or um, having in within the loop uh, of the estimation of the transform, the matching, uh, which is uh, combined with the uh, estimation of the parameter. So, so typically you will try to estimate um, a least, um, using a least square um, a deformation model, translation, rotation, uh, uh, um, more um, rotation, so solid body or affine if you have some uh, nonlinear uh, transformation. You can also uh, use some sort of kernel method, which uh, is called thin plate spline, which uh, approximate um, the deformation field by a smooth function, which goes through uh, the points, and then you have access to all this in, in Fiji, for example, in using big warp. In Python, MATLAB, you will have some uh, ICPD, so for coherent point drift, or the computer vision toolbox in, in, uh, in MATLAB. Or you will have some library in Python called ITK, for example, for uh, registration. Um, yeah. Now there is finally a last method of um, estimating, estimating uh, displacement in the image called optical flow. The optical flow assume a preservation of the intensity over time. Uh, it, uh, it estimates a displacement at each pixel, and there is a, a, a problem in the, in the formulation of the optical flow, which is called the uh, aperture problem. We say that if we have, um, um, for example, if I 
if I draw here, I cannot here. I have a point here and I want to, uh, here and I want to do, know where it will go here. There is, um, so we get a line. We, on the line like this, it will be, there will be no information on where it went on the, on the line because it could be from here to there. The line is similar for all along this, uh, this three vector or it could be any kind of direction along, along the line. So there is a tangent uh, problem here, so where we have no information. So we can try to solve this by adding a smoothness on the, the, the flow, on the gradient. And, um, and this allows you us to using so, uh, so the data fitting, which will be assuming minimizing the, the discrepancy of, of the intensity between the two images on the smoothness of the flow, which is our a priori. By minimizing this cost function, we find this uh, vector field. In general, this uh, procedure is very local and doesn't see very far in the image. So we need a multi-resolution approach to capture large displacement. Um, now, another thing you want, you may want to do is to find object, non-resolved object that can be seen uh, as um, approximated as a, as a blob or a spot. So we want to, to, to find them. It can be uh, as small as a, a vesicle, so 100 nanometer, for example, uh, to or a single molecule uh, to a, a nuclei. So you can, you can go through different scale as long as the object is not so well resolved because there is not much detail either because of the resolution of the microscope or the object itself, you can use a blob detection to, uh, to find object of interest. The so the different detector you, you can find are lo a simple local maxima if the blob is, is bright. You can have uh, different of Gaussian, of two Gaussian filters. So you, you blur the image by two Gaussian filter and you take the difference or you compute directly a difference of Gaussian filter it will be the same, the, the filter is linear. You can have also the Laplacian of, of Gaussian filter, which is a uh, derivative, the second derivative of a Gaussian function, which also is an, an oscillating function able to, to find blobs. And this allows you, is, this filter are controlled by, by a scale, which would be the standard deviation of our Gaussian filter. And it allows you to uh, the extract blob as is uh, specified scales. You can also go for multi-scale approaches where you compute uh, the filter at various scales, which then leads you to techniques such as wavelet transform, where you will have um, uh, all multi-scale representation of your image. And find in this representation um, blobs uh, on, on a feature of interest. So this is, as I say, an easy way to detect a single molecule, vesicle, nuclei, etc., with everything which is not uh, with very defined shape. And it can be combined with uh, 2D or 3D Gaussian fitting if your object is is uh, can be approximated with a, a Gaussian function uh, to uh, improve. For example, the localization accuracy, and this is what makes the base of the single molecule localization microscopy that you will see with John next, next time. Um, so these kind of approaches are easy to script in any languages. Uh, you, they are also available in TrackMate, for example, for, for, uh, for, for Fiji. I see as a wavelet spot detector on Imaris. We, uh, offer also a spot detection module in, in 3D, which is very uh, convenient. You can also, instead of just going for a little spot, you could uh, consider a more complex shape and want to um, assign labels, so background, foreground, or nuclei versus uh, uh, cell boundary, for example, to each pixel. So 
So there are two types of segmentation that we saw already. So we detect each pixel belonging to a class, so semantic segmentation or instance segmentation, where we identify pixel belonging to each object on their class. Um, you, it can be as simple as a thresholding combined, for example, with a watershed approach to identify individual objects. Uh, you could consider active, uh, active contours, which try to snap to edges of object, um, or some which are based on, on intensity, where you try to find objects which have a similar object uh, intensity, a region of the image which have similar intensity. Uh, so you have you can find them cool as snake level set or balloon. You can have graph-based methods where the image is modeled with a Markov random field where the label, so the, the, the class of each pixel is a hidden uh, variable. And you can use uh, graph cut techniques to uh, retrieve the uh, smooth and regularized um, uh, field of, of labels. Mm. You have also uh, some machine learning approaches, pixel classification where you uh, input um, various features, like an average filter. So you basically compute many filters on the image. And the uh, classifier will try to find, um, to group this uh, feature in, in different uh, uh, region, depending on, on the label you, you have provided and find a, a, a partition. So depending on the approach, uh, of classification, classification method, you, you will have different um, uh, results. You have also uh, some deep learning method where you, um, like UNET, where you stack various uh, convolution and, um, and uh, pulling uh, into an uh, um, into a, a first encoder, and then you have a upscaling pass where you go back from the from the labels to to, um, to, the, to the label at the image size using an uh, an expansion part. You can also combine uh, detection and segmentation using, for example, mask RCNN. You would have some region proposal part, and then try region. Uh, uh, classif classification and segmentation part. You can have uh, in Fiji, part in particular, you will have access to Stardis, which is uh, uh, geared toward uh, convex regions, such as nuclei, for example. So the basic, in, uh, from a software point of view, the basic method are ABQ, so you can find them everywhere, thresholding, watershed, or even active contour. You can have access to pixel classification using renewable webcast segmentation in Fiji or Elastic, which is a standalone tool. You can have access to a deep learning tool in, in Python or even in, in Fiji now uh, for, for some of the, of the tools. Now, once you have objects such as spots or uh, of region of interest which have been segmented, you, you may want to track them over time. So tracking means maintaining uh, identity of the object over time. And um, difficulty, the main difficulty in tracking are the density in the feature space. So if you are, feature could be just the location, so X and Y, position in 2D, or N. The other problem is the apparent velocity, how much they, they will cross each other uh, on how fast they go. So, so the slower they go, the easier it is to, to do the tracking. The algorithm can go for a simple nearest neighbor to um, uh, for the association of one frame to another to a minimization of uh, association costs based on you build basically a distance matrix between the, the features or just uh, coordinates of your uh, objects and you, you find the best uh, uh, assignment, so it's an assignment problem. Uh, you, and then you can use motion model to predict the next position given the past of, uh, of the particle. 
And if you want to use also the future because you have access to past on future, it will be more filter uh, filtering. So it's called Kalman filtering, the simplest version of this. So from the point of view of software, you will have access to this in, uh, in Fiji, for example, you can use TrackMate, which includes so, defense of Gaussian on the linear assignment problem. So minimize the distance ma uh, matrix. In IC, you have a more sophisticated uh, uh, um, tracking algorithm called the multiple hypothesis tracking algorithm. You have also uh, similar to TrackMate in, in, uh, in Imari. So the, once you have your spot, you can use this uh, uh, linear assignment problem and formulation to, to track your, your object. You have also a tracking module in Nikon Element in one of the versions we have in the analysis room. And once you have track, you can uh, consider uh, track analysis. So um, compute the instant velocity, measure the variation of a feature over time. For example, you would have a variation of intensity uh, to retrieve, uh, for example, some bleaching or information or some um, activation or some exchange. Uh, you can also uh, try to characterize the, the displacement, the process. Uh, the, is it diffusion, subdiffusion, super diffusion? So using techniques such as MSD, which are known to be very uh, uh, noisy, let's say, when you don't have enough uh, uh, tracks. So you need a lot of, a lot of tracks to, to be able to compute this MSD. So to, to um, be a bit more precise, there have been uh, recent papers such as uh, this uh, variational based uh, single particle tracking approach, which tries to estimate states, portion states. So these are D is a diffusion. So you, coefficient you will have, you could find different different coefficient, uh, and um, uh, using a HMM, so hidden Markov model, you will have probability of transition between uh, these three states, and then you could map. Uh, the state in in the sample in the image uh, and some other work proposed to uh, build a map of diffusion coefficient or of our states to have an idea of um, the localization of the local topology in terms of uh, diffusion you can also once you have for example segmented or detected object uh, be interested in uh, co-localization, so quantify the interaction of two labeling. So here we see an, an A, an overlay of this B and C, which appears as yellow. Um, uh, so we, we kind of an, uh, have an idea that there is a sort of co-localization, while here, uh, the bottom row, we, we don't see any uh, yellow image when you do the overlay. So the overlay by itself is very uh, uh, misleading. You can always tweak your intensity to make things appear yellow. So you want to put number on this. You have the um, Pearson correlation coefficient, which tells you how much uh, the two intensity uh, are correlated. So here we have at the top, we see the, um, this plot, this histogram plot, where you have intensity in red and in, in green, which seems to be correlated, while at the bottom they don't look to be correlated. You can also have a measurement based on region. So once you have done the segmentation, you can compute the overlap of the region and compute these two Manders coefficient. You can also, if you have spots which have uh, just coordinate x and y, like in single molecule, for example, or, um, or some smaller object, com compute the pair correlation on the k function. So the pair correlation is a number for each, for a given radius, so it's a function of the radius. For each uh, radius, we compute a number of points, an average of number of points uh, in a small uh, a band. Uh, like a small circle here. Yeah. 
this has given sickness. Um, so the question then is how much is uh, this collectization effect due to randomness, misalignment, or blur? So there are techniques such as uh, randomization test, like post test, uh, randomization test. What I find in general is that you don't really need to do that because often you have um, two conditions. So you are not interested in one. Uh, if, often you are not interested in just one image and saying the two labels are co-localized. You are a control on um, your experiment. Uh, so you, you would have uh, variation between the coefficient you are measuring. This, this will be giving you an idea of a change in your sample. And then if this is if the change is meaningful, then you can uh, conclude something. So it's it's not often that you you go to the effort of trying to test if the colocalization is due to your um, um, due to your microscope, so the blur, the misalignment of the two channels. So this so the misalignment of the channel would be something you would like to correct uh, because it's, it's too systematic and it will hide some something, but it, if there is a difference, then it should be visible in the control on the experimental condition. I think this is my, my last slide. Um, it's about hierarchical um, analysis. So in general, you, once you, you find some object in your image, you want to, to build some relation between the objects, such as proximity or inclusion. So you want to know if this, uh, how many, for example, mitochondria there is in one cell um, and I'll make some average over the old image for each cell. How many cells do you have in this image, et cetera, et cetera. What is the distance between um, the foci and the nuclei in the cell? This kind of thing. So you have uh, different level of semantic levels so of like image, a part of the organ, in this part of the organ, I see this. And so all, I want to see all the cells in this organ. I want to see all the organelle in this cell, which can make a difference. But, um, try to uh, differentiate or what um, the distance, for example, or the description of the feature in, in one cell compared to another cell in a different part of the image. Um, so you can use a mask in, in practice. You, for example, if you do it yourself, you would use mask or ROI, which is basically mask in general, or logical on logical test, does this pixel belongs or of this region belongs to this uh, parent region and store index of parents, for example. You can use distance transform to compute simply, uh, simply the distance uh, between objects. From, and then, uh, so in practice, there is a uh, Nikon element. All this is done quite easily because they have integrated this part um, in, the, in their software. The other way to do it is to manipulate the ROI man, uh, in the ROI manager at Fiji, which is it's not too difficult. Requires more work. So this is this was my last slide. Thank you for uh, listening and joining this. Okay. Thank you very much, Jerome. Um, as before, on we're asking anyone who has any questions to please um, put them in the Q and A. Um, and Jerome will read them out and uh, attempt to answer them. So if anyone has any questions, could they please put them in the Q&A? Uh, so yeah, do, do you provide training on the data processing? Yeah, we, so we, yeah. So we do regularly, I do a macro training. <laughs> we can do, so given the situation now, we do uh, like one-to-one -one training for Nikon Element. Um, and yeah, I don't, I, I, I didn't, I, I gave up the global <laughs> image processing training that I did once, was not very successful, but yeah. So, but if you're interested, please drop me an email and see what. Um, 
So Marcus uh, asked uh, for image segmentation, would you do a deconvolution on noise reduction beforehand? Uh, so, um, so it would be the first uh, noise reduction before and then a deconvolution if you need to, because it's not always necessary to, to go through the effort of um, putting this tool together because it's often uh, not easy to, to put in a pipeline. Uh, how generic are these methods for image obtaining from different type of microscope, uh, optical versus EM? So, uh, the, so the deconvolution, for example, would be very specific because the image uh, formation process is, is very different. Uh, you, have, you would have to change. The thing is, we would have to change the point spread function, which is in EM called contrast uh, uh, trans um, coherent tr transfer function, so the CTF, so, uh, so which is defined in, in Fourier space. Um, so we'll be, you would have to adapt some, some few things for everything which is uh, motion will be very similar. In light microscopy, we, we have one luck is that the fluorescence microscopy is specific, it means you label the object you want to, to see, while in EM, you, it's not specific, you, you label everything, uh, there is, everything is it's the same, so it, it's uh, much more difficult to segment electron microscopy images uh, such as tomography, uh, EM tomography images, or um, TM, simple TM, yeah, then to segment uh, light microscopy images. But the principle, the global principle every, from the, is the same. So that the methods, the basic methods are the same. Okay. Are there any more questions? I can't see any. Oh, so one more. What was that? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> okay, then. Uh, thanks again, Jerome. And uh, we hope to see you all back again next Tuesday for another episode of Light Microscopy. Thanks. Okay.